Good morning, good morning, and Come. welcome to our monthly webcast. I am Samir Mehta, your moderator. This is session number 130, and who would have ever thought we would be in this condition? Last time session, I started by doing a namaste to you. I thought that was the end of it, and now here we are, masks and gloves, and uh, complying with every regulation. Uh, uh, deeply humbled, uh, yet with the complete understanding that if we are ever able to I come don't. out of the present crisis, it is going to be no, the no, doctors no. who are probably Dad, the modern mean? soldiers in our war against COVID-19. I hope all of you are taking ample precautions. Uh, we have a very special case today, and there was absolutely... Today should be a demonstration that a CCC live cases is never cancelled. Uh, we are here bringing you in a more innovative uh, fashion today something that you are also experiencing almost constantly in the cardiac cath lab. Uh, patients uh, with STEMI, how do you do? Sorry. These are not the elective cases and uh, we are going to take you through a thorough discussion today about the pathophysiology, the cardiovascular manifestations of COVID. We'll again uh, discuss in detail uh, STEMI, what should be the protocols which can be safely followed. And of course, there is a tape case which we'll share with you. We also have a guest today, which Dr. Sharma will introduce, but without any delay, let me take you to the cath lab where Dr. Kinney and Dr. Sharma, here they are, Samin, uh, good morning. Uh, never ever thought in our lives we could have a day like this. Well, I can tell you absolutely, but with the, our resources, we are still mimicking. We are in the cath lab as if we are doing the case. Although we are not doing the case as we know with recorded, but yes, the COVID-19 has really brought so many unusual uh, unimaginable uh, things in our life. And I think the life post-COVID will never be the same what it was in the beginning. And uh, we, myself and uh, Dr. Keeney, welcome all our CCC participants globally. And we thank for their support. And this, uh, the virtual case today, will have at, le at least, not the live demonstration, but will have the same message of uh, educating, teaching, and updating in this field. With that, uh, I actually have a special guest here, Dr. Jagat Narula, who is the Chief of Cardiology at Mount Sinai Morningside, which is a new name for our old St. Luke's. And he has been a tremendous academician and will have a, has a great knowledge about the subject of COVID. So I invited him to make a comments from time to time. Jagat, we welcome you here. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. It's totally honored to be with you here. And uh, I'm, I, I truly admire you and Dr. Kinney that uh, you have uh, taken this initiative today that you would not be interrupting this absolutely uninterrupted series for uh, 10 years now. And uh, so basically, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely admirable. And thank you very much for bringing me here. And I would, I would try to assist you as much as I could. And, and particularly Sameer, he has been the constant, even for this, he flew yesterday and of course we'll go back but i samir thank you very much to keep this uninterrupted we actually talked about the do we do a zoom conference and uh, your remote uh, presentation you know we have been part of all i actually personally if there's a choice there's no comparison of the webinar the way we do with the video compared to the zoom or skype so i'm glad that we are able to do it as we plan so with that note, Anu, you want to start the so comment Anu, on this and then we go. Yeah. Anu and Samin, there is first uh, disclosure I have to make that for the first time in 11 years that we've been doing it, I have been averaging more than twice the cases of any of you. <laughs> okay, so my work, with, my work with STEMI <laughs> intervention has proceeded. Uh, and again, uh, we, we need to be taking all the precautions. Anu, take us through what is the plan for today. Okay. Samir, Samir yeah. record it and get it signed from Dr. Sharma. You will never get this chance again <laughs> in your life. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's just start the slide, uh, our uh, presentation, please. Good. So these are our supporters, usual uh, disclosures here. And uh, they start with the case and happen to be in the right amidst of this storm. 
and will convey some of the important message which i am going to discuss in my two points this is a 43 year old male he had no risk factor except smoking long time ago uh, while no medication and he had chest pain and shortness of breath and low grade fever and cough for 40 uh, 40 hours at home and stayed and clearly as we know everybody is afraid to come to the hospital this has been the part of the various uh, news media presentation actually i have another case which will be reviewed interviewed by the new york times today also sat over the weekend uh, and came a lady with the mi yesterday so patient came to the er and the first ekg showed uh, which i am going to show you along with the chest x ray in this particular case showing such segmental atelectasis and ground glass opacity so this is the first ecg you can see already q wave and st elevation and uh, and you want to comment on it because you did this case yeah this patient uh, presented to the er with the chest pain and if you see same thing i think he has been having chest pain for a while but uh, refused to come to the er and presented uh, late so when he presented he already had uh, q waves in the anterior lid young guy uh, based on just on the history uh, and i think this is a uh, one key thing i'll tell you what has happened in this uh, covid era is uh, interventional cardiologist uh, are becoming uh, clinicians because you need to take a good history make a decision should do we take this patient directly to the lab or are we doing uh, you know initial uh, covid management and more important is that uh, instead of uh, talking tips and tricks and how to do intervention uh, we uh, this uh, during covid time we have become microbiologist virologist and pharmacotha pharmacologist so we are reading all different subject back to our medical school so with this patient i think just based on the history he described uh, we knew it was a coronary syndrome and uh, without covid testing this was early part we just brought him up to do an angiogram and this will come back to you and i'll ask you uh, samir what how would you manage this case but let me just take you through uh, one or two slides more x ray typical the infiltration and little ground glass opacities and uh, so this case after admission none before admission after after admission started on aspirin ticagrelor beta blocker uh, these were actually subsequent to the admission but patient was started on azithromycin because of fever and uh, ejection fraction was 24% and uh, cardiac cath revealed proximal thrombotic LED which underwent uh, intervention so this, so this patient uh, was brought and we did have uh, you know ample precaution uh, though we you know whatever was available we did ample precaution and did this so as soon as we went in we knew this is a real uh, we a uh, radial procedure went into the lv edp was high uh, you see this uh, you know anterolateral uh, apical wall everything uh, is severely hypo um, and maybe uh, the, there is a suggestion that uh, apical thrombus plus minus you know you don't see the dye going all the way to the apex next yeah so before we go on to let's go back one so this case uh, samir in your opinion uh, should come to the cath lab or should we wait for the covid testing this looks like a covid patient who is having STEMI. right so straightforward uh, i'll uh, you know i think it's important for how people to understand initially this would be straightforward you're probably going to have a proximal led i would have normally taken him to the cath lab uh, straight uh, with the guiding catheter and fix the led with or without uh, aspiration now the trouble here is uh, uh, in the present crisis, uh, you need to be protective of the entire cath lab, including ourselves. So what we are doing at the moment, we've been uh, having a preferential strategy of thrombolysis, except for patients who are definitely COVID-19 uh, negative, which is very tricky. Uh, we'll talk about it. I think you may be showing a protocol slide, which we have done also. But uh, the intent is otherwise, uh, unless the patient is in cardiogenic shock, a uh, very young patient with a large amount of myocardium in jeopardy, a 40-year-old with the anterior wall MI, except for those cases, we are giving... Uh, uh, thrombolysis uh, to most of our patients and if they do not reperfuse at 60 minutes then uh, take them to the cath lab very good point so that is, that is, is not that is yeah. that is not something i have uh, advocated or uh, <laughs> practiced for uh, 20 years but uh, this is the protocol which has been decided not only amongst the hospitals uh, where i take call but also amongst the cardiologists in miami absolutely and i'll come back and uh, 
uh, allude to that and clearly there are some places people doing this rapid testing which is plus minus and we'll take your opinion later so this case went to the cath lab this while waiting for covid knowing as anu mentioned that life saving young person you need to save right corner is good and as we expected as you so saw it we give went with the guide catheter on the left side circumflex normal and the classical form of first a plaque rupture thrombotic plaque rupture no other disease in this particular case went through the same process of uh, thrombectomy uh, and uh, this is the picture after thrombectomy then a lot of thrombus is still uh, and uh, the patient as i mentioned earlier ticagrelor was done on bivalodin stent was post dilated and uh, this is the uh, the results after and uh, this was the final result on this case with a timi 3 flow good myocardial blush so now the to complete the story this was the uh, can we just play those pictures please uh, echo they need to be played oh it will play with this no so they had to be clicked on actually yeah no you should have you, you want to click on yeah okay, no you see it now yeah. we see it now yeah. we see so it whole now. question is uh, and you want to describe this echo with lv thrombus possible or so no so you see the septum and the base is moving very good apex totally uh, i would say uh, akinetic and uh, the definitely no trauma you definitely have to give some uh, definity to see but uh, based on this one you cannot uh, uh, clearly define that there is thrombus or no but uh, it does not look like it's thrombus in the apex good. go next and basically there were two ek the echoes done in the cath lab ef was red 24% then patient had echo was 30% and the next day was 35% so this particular case now to complete the story patient tested positive for covid 19 antigen became afebrile on antibiotics and did well on guided medical therapy subsequent echo showed ef of 35% peak ckmb of 182 units so he peaked actually at admission so it went down so clearly had mi at home so this is just to emphasize in this era that if you are having a cardiac problem don't wait home you need to get to the access to the medical uh, treatment and uh, i know there is a concern about the covid exposure but at the same time you patient should not wait and so that this kind of a serious cardiac event can occur at home and we'll come back to this point a little bit later part of our uh, presentation so this leads to the this is the new creature which we never knew about it but very looks very fancy pictures you see more and more uh, with the covid and actually that has become part of the cartoon and our real life now and that is where the covid uh, and uh, we are going to talk about the two important points one is the cardiovascular system manifestation of covid-19 and then incidence and management of stemming in stemi in the covid era so starting with the the first one is actually i use this um, uh, the nice review in jama cardiology about the co potential effect of coronavirus in the cardiovascular system which leads to i leave now let anu talk about this uh, virus itself because she has done she as you may she mentioned she has become the virologist now yes and no yeah so if you see that i think uh, why they call this uh, coronavirus is because of the spike that looks like a crown and uh, let me tell you the four subgroups of this but what is uh, more interesting when we got to know is alpha and beta and all the viruses that have come uh, to us uh, is from the beta family which starts with mers which was in a camel to humans and then became uh, you know the coronavirus which uh, is uh, they don't say it one but the first one that was also from bats to humans and the current one which actually is called as uh, uh, sars co2 but 19 because it started in 2019 and that that also was uh, from uh, bat now the question always is there is always a reservoir which is a bat and then uh, you they always say that you need a carrier or a vector and that is i think the studies have shown in you know, studies done in australia that a pangolin and a animal um is the one that becomes the vector and finally man becomes the host and i think what this coronavirus has you seen that uh, spikes which is very important that is the s protein and that s protein goes and attaches to what is called as uh, ace2 um uh, you know in our receptors now we have seen so many symptoms and most of the symptoms are 
uh, in the respiratory. Why? Because these uh, uh, ACE2 uh, receptors are more prominent in what is called as a type 2 pneumocytes, uh, which are present only in adults. And that may be the reason in children it's not well developed. Uh, this type 2 pneumocyte uh, produces a surfactant. And uh, once this thing attaches to that, there is a lack of surfactant, and that's why they develop uh, the ARDS kind of uh, symptoms, and also the reason why children are not uh, mostly affected. Arteries of uh, what is called as uh, the cholangiocytes, ileum, colon, and that is why they have GI symptoms and myocytes also that is why you know when we see st elevation very important like i mentioned that you got to take a history to understand is it a acs or uh, is it uh, many people have presented with myocarditis also and then proximal convoluted uh, tubules are also called as podocytes which are present in the kidney and uh, this uh, what happens is once they get uh, infected they develop um, uh, what is called as uh, endothelial dysfunction and then the cascade of thrombosis uh, starts this is how uh, uh, it starts now uh, just to give you a little bit more about the virology is uh, the same that this is a very this virus has an uh, envelope which uh, we can see it in the picture uh, this envelope uh, is very easily broken and that is why we keep saying is wash hands because uh, so, uh, you know solvents as well as alcohol destroys that uh, destroys that uh, envelope um, and most of it is stable but still there is what is called as 10 percent mutation which is very important that we need to know because the genomic sequence that was done all around the world, we found that there was 10% mutation, uh, not uh, in, uh, in this virus. So now uh, let's ask Jagat, uh, uh, knowing quite a bit of this uh, in this field, knowing that we, our society, uh, globally have went through various other SARS epidemics, uh, our um, earlier SARS uh, and then uh, Ebola and you know maybe some modified one. What is about this virus, which has changed our life and has become pandemic? What is your opinion, Jagat? So, uh, Dr. Sharma, it is obviously the uh, beta coronavirus, as uh, uh, Dr. Kinney just said. So, something quite similar. However, the most important thing is that uh, there is a significant amount of the people or significant proportion of the people are asymptomatic with this. And that is the reason that this has had a devastating effect. Although the SARS, the first COVID virus, which we had seen much earlier, uh, that was way more, way more aggressive in terms of uh, its lethality. And, uh, but this one particularly has clearly been less lethal as compared to that, much more so than the influenza virus, as we very well know. But since these are all asymptomatic cases, at least 30% of the cases are asymptomatic. It is believed, although the New England Journal of Medicine paper, which just appeared from uh, uh, New York itself, where they had seen it in the pregnant women, it was expected to be about 15% of the people were COVID positive pregnant women when they came for, for delivery. So at least 15 to 30% of the people are walking around with this virus and that is what makes it more dangerous as compared to anyone else and that is why it has become extremely important extremely important from the public epidemiological standpoint that we maintain the social distancing the lockdown should be followed and most importantly that we should be doing as many tests as possible and as you would see that the countries who have done exceptionally well in this case for example south korea for example, um, now India and uh, the China after uh, its uh, initial debacle uh, that they have been testing vigorously and uh, that is the reason that they have been able to isolate these people so that the spread of the disease could be prevented. So the most important thing is that till we find a cure, till we find a prevention, the best prevention is to be able to avoid the contact here and uh, the, the infectivity of the virus specifically when you look at the r naught of it the r naught of it was expected initially to be about 2.2 but now we are seeing that it is hitting around six to seven which essentially means that one person who is infected infects about six or seven persons around him which is too much of a transmission 
no Jagan very important now let's see both of them i just wanted to complete this uh, uh, on this issue and uh, uh, samir then you'll ask uh, that any opinion is this virus replicate more fast faster than other viruses or what is uh, or it's just about the same so nothing to do with the replication it is just uh, that it's quite a bit asymptomatic and it goes to so many other people i know anything yeah. yeah yeah i think uh, like uh, dr narula mentioned is the transmission uh, is a problem and it is transmitted mostly uh, through the same uh, respiratory means uh, if uh, anybody coughs sneezes or even while talking uh, this uh, virus comes out and i think the uh, you are showing the life cycle there uh, the exactly what happens that it enters through the membrane and once it is there since it is enveloped enveloped get dissolved then the mrna comes out it goes to the host uh, you know uh, ribosome that is where more mrna is produced the new virus comes out and uh, this is a replication and more of the like you said asymptomatic people are walking around talking sneezing and uh, it just given to um, uh, everybody else and uh, symptoms only appears thankfully in uh, maybe 10% and of that uh, maybe 3 to 5 becomes critically ill um, of this pe uh, people okay samir your question yes uh, well first of all anu it's good to have you as a resident virologist in the cath lab <laughs> uh, uh, i thought i had seen enough with the interventional cardiologist doing uh, coronary complex interventions uh, to structural heart to yoga and here is the virologist so but a wonderful uh, uh, overview jagat three specific questions which i can guarantee you are on the minds of our viewers number one what is the status of remdesivir no that will come back later we'll come okay. back to the, the treatment yeah what else the treatment uh, will be no, absolutely no yeah. then yeah. then again the next two are uh, going to be chloroquine and the status yeah, treatment, of vaccination yeah. no then we'll come we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll come, come back to that right time okay. yeah absolutely one thing i would like yeah. to add uh, mm. uh, samir here that uh, uh, as uh, uh, you were just talking about the mutation part whether the virus mutates as fast as the hiv virus or not anu has really mutated here into a virologist so that part is quite sure. <laughs> the one other thing which i would like to ask dr sharma before we move forward it is a 43 years old person a male who is an ex smoker only went 5 years ago he stopped uh, yeah. he quit smoking would you call it a plaque rupture at all because these are such clean coronary arteries and it is in the proximal lesion if at all there is an atherosclerosis minimal atherosclerosis i don't know what exactly it was but uh, there are two possibilities here uh, in from the pathogenesis perspective if you truly believe that there was a 10% 20% 30% lesion in a setting of a smoker where the ground substance has changed and all it could have been plaque erosion right. one or two that now with the covid that we are seeing aggressively that there is a possibility of not only the venous side thrombosis it is and that that happens with all the viral diseases be it uh, uh, varicella or be it fuzz sars or be it dengue fever or whatever we can think about it all happens there and can it just be a simple clot which is formed and uh, whether it's a platelet is formed a clot or it is a red clot or whatever else it is we do not know but uh, this uh, uh, thrombosis in c2 could have been a direct result of a covid because there is no doubt about it that the case was a covid case yeah so, so i would say that yeah you're right uh, if i'll ask anu to say from my point of view i have to put a bet on a uh, plaque rupture uh, plaque erosion or inside to thrombosis i would say inside to thrombosis number 1 then maybe erosion and lastly the plaque rupture is unlikely in this particular case where other arteries are so pristine clear yeah. i know what do you think no i think i would go to what uh, dr narulas because this patient uh, was covid positive uh, this is uh, most likely related to covid itself if this uh, if it was not in the setting of the covid where we are trying to do procedure uh, what we say minimally invasive we already are minimally invasive we probably are becoming super minimally invasive because i do not want to expose uh, more um, you know my fellows and our uh, 
cath lab staff to more uh, of, the, of this patient during COVID time, we should have done an intravascular uh, uh, OCT to understand what it is, but I think it is in situ thrombosis related to endothelial dysfunction uh, due to COVID. Because in the angiogram, you can see a nice big chunk of thrombus. That's why we try to aspirate. We got a little bit of a thrombus out, but still, since late presentation, was uh, still a lot which disappeared after we stented and uh, did a post dilation. So now, also, we talked about that how long the virus can last. There are a few slides I'm going to show you with the temperature wise, with the steel, yeah. cardboard, and so, yeah. So what this study actually uh, presented in New England Journal, what showed was the same, that uh, once the virus is up in the air, right? Like I just mentioned, how it gets transmitted, uh, usually by coughing, sneezing, talking, the virus uh, comes out aerosolized and uh, it is up in the air. In the air, it can be, in, if it's a closed room, you are it's uh, circulating three to four hours and uh, there is this theory, you open the door so that uh, there is more aeration and the virus disappears. If it goes and sits, sits on any hard surface, so if you see that, copper is the lowest, but more important, what do we face? On our, in our daily life is uh, any kind of a hard surface which is plastic, stainless steel and cardboard they say is like a cloth. So it sticks to everything, including your hair. That is why you got to walk around with a cap when you are in uh, the hospital. And if it's, uh, you know, you're, if you are uh, go walking around and you have anything, your cloth, the same thing, you remove it, it stays in this hard surface up to 12 hours. Sometimes up to in uh, plastic, it stays up to 72 hours, but you can say 12 to 24 hours. So. Take, take out your clothing and, uh, you know, put some kind of a disinfectant on the clothing and keep it separate. Do not take it home. And uh, other surfaces we know, that's why they're saying uh, do not touch and uh, wear gloves or uh, you have to keep cleaning uh, these uh, surfaces since this virus gets killed by any kind of a disinfectant. Uh, so that was an, uh, this was an important paper to tell us uh, why is this uh, social distancing and cleaning the hands, cleaning all the surfaces uh, is uh, very important. And one precaution, I think all uh, physicians who are working in the hospital take care of this COVID patients. When you go home, change your clothing uh, before you go home and uh, just leave whatever uh, clothes you had. That means you got to change to scrubs when you come to the hospital and uh, leave the scrubs here for cleaning. And do not, whenever, even when you go home, you know, keep it separate, again disinfect and wash it separate. So now question is, I know we stopped shaking hands. Anybody knows how long the virus lasts on the hands? You, I, I, say, I think regular muco, mucosa, body, surface, everything is same. Is uh, you know six six hours, six to eight hours. Okay, so after expo, touching any um, article with the virus, uh, don't uh, no shaking hand, which has disappeared anyway. Uh, now more important is. The, in terms of the temperature, and this is, we think, uh, environmental sensitivity will be a very important, uh, will play a very important role in this uh, subsequent manifestation or uh, the appearance of this disease process, that virus gets killed at the higher temperature. So they actually have very nice uh, uh, algorithms or uh, this expected that higher the temperature, virus lasts only for maybe a few minutes with a 70 degree centigrade. Question will be that we are hoping that May 15th, which has been a time for the lockdown to be uh, disappear in New York and I'm sure many other places, maybe same time or uh, earlier, that uh, the infectivity of the virus will go down. How optimistic we are? Comment from both of you. I am very optimistic about this and I think this is the reason why the virus is not spreading in India because the temperature right now, you know, it is summer there. Um, that probably is the reason uh, more than, uh, you know, lockdown and social distancing uh, taking uh, that um, population of over a billion. Uh, Dr. Yes. Sama, I am, I, am, I am cautiously optimistic. I am not optimistic, I am cautiously optimistic. Okay. The reason being that, yes, California is doing much better, Florida may be doing much better, Texas, but they still have the infection. India still has the infection. We are at certain places, the temperature has risen to beyond 40 degrees Celsius. So I'm, I'm not, uh, and then there have been certain reports that if you want to totally destroy the virus, you will have to boil the virus for 15 minutes yeah. at 92 degrees Celsius to completely get rid of it. Yeah. So, so sure, I'm optimistic. 
but cautiously optimistic. So I think uh, at the end, we have to prevent, and the prevention is by social distancing. Prevention is by locking yourself in till you are able to reduce the number of the people who can spread it. Absolutely. So I mean, most I, I think yeah. uh, one of the reasons to feel optimistic is uh, watching carefully what is happening as there has been a gradual opening up in China. You know, many people were fearing that uh, they are going to have an absolute sudden spurt and resurgence. That has not Nothing. happened. Yeah. And also, uh, you know, Italy and France and Spain are also a few days ahead of us. Uh, so far, uh, I, I think uh, cautiously is the right word, but uh, there is reason to be optimistic. Uh, the challenge, of course, is going to be in the winter months again, uh, could there be a re-emergence, a mutation of a new virus, of a new strain, but that hopefully will, uh, only time so, will tell. So, so Samir ji, the uh, two important things here, cautiously optimistic is the right term, but then my cautious optimism was for the temperature. Uh, here you are talking of uh, the optimism in terms of whether there will be a reinfection or not. So yes, I'm, I'm uh, hoping that uh, we have some semblance of uh, uh, herd immunity here, although it is not uh, coming across as aggressive as the Oxford investigators had first believed. Uh, and uh, that's what you are seeing in the South uh, Korea also. 167 cases reported this past week of uh, reinfection. The people who had turned negative, they became positive again. So basically, I think uh, for this purpose also, I will go with the term cautious optimism. And my optimism is more dependent on not this, but essentially on the fact that probably by that time, which we will be coming to later, that we will have the antiviral drugs. I am even more optimistic about drugs than about vaccine, and I'll tell you why when we go there. But uh, remdesivir or, uh, uh, or the favipiravir or whatever uh, comes out as the RNA polymerase inhibitors, we basically should be able to control this. I think that is the, the will be the anchor for uh, our success in the coming winter. Yeah, so basically in order to what uh, Jagat just said, in order to get antiviral therapy, in order to get vaccine, you need to have a protein, uh, the exact amino acid sequence. And those are the few slides which will answer this and uh, spikes and protein. And that's how you can get to the virus. This is more of a virology and that <laughs> lead to the segue for hours. So which already have mentioned, uh, Anu mentioned about the ACE2 uh, receptor. And this is what we said, infectivity point of view, the COVID uh, average case fatality rate of 10, while others have even much higher fatality. So overall the, in the data has been that uh, about, uh, you know, anywhere from one to 12% uh, overall mortality uh, in the COVID-2 and uh, the infection is one person can give to uh, three people and so and so forth. So this is uh, basically uh, tons of contact. We have already spoken about various of these aspects. And uh, the key is that all uh, the, there are risk group which has been identified patients, particularly the older age, underlying comorbidities like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic obstructive disease, obesity. Obesity somehow uh, is very important factor in both occurrence of the virus and that subsequent complication of the virus with the morbidity and mortality. Uh, somehow, the children and infants are spared, although some cases have been there, but overall, uh, it uh, does not happen. So now we actually have a very good data from the New York City proper. 393 consecutive patients of the COVID-19, they made a very rapid registry and published in NEJM yesterday. And it turns out to be, as you can see, that high invasive mechanical ventilation, the but deterioration occurs in some patient and about one third of the patient require mechanical ventilation. These are the individual data of New York City. Now we are not talking about China, Italy or Spain. Right in New York City, average age is 62. Those who require invasive mechanical ventilation versus no invasive. That means more aggressive disease on the middle one compared to the right side. Age and male, somehow preponderance of male. As you can see there, obesity and other factors. The, the risk factor point of view, the symptoms are here, 80% cough, fever, dyspnea, myalgia, diarrhea, vomiting. They did not report any neurologic symptom, which have been reported in some other studies. And during a hospital stay, 
lot of uh, arrhythmias, patients on visual pressure support, renal failure, and death occurs on average 10%. So these are the patients in New York City and discharge from the hospital is also very encouraging that two thirds of the patients are discharged. So not bad. I mean, if you really look at the all consecutive patients with the two hospital centers, which published here, how do you, what do you comment, Jagat, on this? So, uh, Dr. Sharma, this was a very, very, this was the very first one from the, from New York, 300 some patients, which came out of the NYU. Uh, but uh, the data from NICET has been reported yesterday, which has been submitted for publication. NICET is New York Coronavirus uh, Informatics Task Force, which has been developed at the Mount Sinai hospitals. And it includes not only the main hospital, but all the hospital uh, affiliated with the Mount Sinai, and they reported the data on 5,000 patients. Uh, yesterday, the lead authors there are uh, Dr. Girish Natkarni, Dr. Benjamin Glicksberg, and Dr. Alex Charney. And uh, that paper has just been submitted, and that shows something quite similar here, that the people uh, uh, who have been uh, admitted to the hospital, about 29% of wait, them okay. ended up dying. Wait. Tell them and, to wait. My uh, about, case is one and uh, 36%, four. as you said, uh, uh, were in the intensive care out of the total admissions. And um, at that time, when this data was uh, given, the, there were about 2,000 patients when it was all analyzed. And uh, the people who died, the average age was uh, 75 years, while the people who were admitted to the hospital, the average age was 65. 60 to 40, the male to female uh, ratio there. And the risk factors are uh, essentially the same as uh, you uh, just uh, uh, suggested. And uh, then the most important thing was, and I guess you will be coming to it, so that's why I don't want to preempt it as to what the uh, the coagulation status yeah. was, and sure. so I don't yeah. want to preempt. Yeah. So we'll come there. Now, I know you are also part of that, uh, trying to get some project and information about this, uh, the New York, uh, uh, the database which have been created with Mount Sinai. Uh, how are we publishing from there yet? That's, uh, I think, same publication Dr. Narula was uh, talking about. But to get more into cardiovascular, we just have to uh, get, um, you know, identify the identify data and uh, get more of the imaging uh, uh, work uh, of uh, individual patient before we can uh, uh, publish. Okay, so let's go to keep moving. Uh, cardiovascular complications are acute coronary syndrome, MI, STEMI, myocarditis, I'll come back to that. Tachycardia, hypotension, arrhythmia, AFib, very common. Actually, I know for four of my patients who had paroxysmal AFib and uh, the many of them, as I mentioned earlier, self, uh, asymptomatic and self-limiting. Now, this is again data from New York. Clearly, I think to me, that's more contemporary what it lasts for 18 patients, STEMI patients done at uh, various centers in New York. They presented that uh, patients uh, had uh, only 64% as a normal D-dimer level. Some patients develop ST elevation of, the, of these 18. Some of them develop ST elevation in hospital. They did not have ST elevation at the time of admission. And then, of course, uh, they uh, deteriorate. And uh, myocardial injury could be due to a pile, the plaque rupture, cytokine, storm, and so And this is basically puts down the risk factor of patients who had a MI versus myocardial injury. 18 patients, as you can see here, the various risk factors. Also very interesting for this STEMI group of patients that those who have low ejection fraction with MI, yes, but patients with a non-coronary, which is myocardial injury, that about 22% has a also has a low ejection fraction. But uh, clearly when you are STEMI and from coronary artery disease is more common. Second, patients who have STEMI patients who went for the cath, the nine patients went for the cath of the STEMI group, six out of six had uh, on the angiography, uh, had the myocardial, you know, in the yeah, MI group, but in the myocardial yeah. injury group, uh, none of them have obstructive CAD. So key, it turns out to be that with the ST elevation patient who went to the cath lab, about two third, had obstructive CAD. And of course, the, the way it was treated as shown here, majority uh, went to the cath lab and had the PCI and rest of the medical therapy shown here. And more important, look at the bottom. Death in hospital is 50% for the MI and 90% for the injury. I mean, this is way beyond even patients in cardiac shock. Cardiac shock at this time is 50-55% and these patients are not in shock. Many of them, uh, they're just ST elevation, but mortality of this disease uh, in COVID positive MI, 
50 percent non mi marker injury 90 percent uh, is a tremendous so uh, jagat you want to comment on that yeah so uh, one thing which i would like everybody to note that dr sharma when he was talking about it he used certain words extremely cautiously and uh, which may not have come apparent when he was talking about it he never used the word myocarditis per se he used the word myocardial injury so although we always believed in the beginning that uh, it could be myocarditis because if it is non atherosclerotic then it probably is myocarditis that is we have always felt that the infection can cause myocarditis and all our basis has been because we saw some edema in the myocardium because of the uh, on the cmr uh, my, magnetic resonance imaging but in the autopsy reports as well as endomyocardial biopsy reports it is not coming out to be true there is no myocarditis whatsoever it is myocardial injury and that's what dr sharma was repeatedly telling that it is myocardial injury and not the myocarditis so issue here is that the viral particles sometimes have been seen but these viral particles are brought to the myocardium through the macrophages they are sitting in the macrophages and the macrophages coming from uh, the lung and uh, so that is the report which came by uh, Eloisa Arbustini from uh, Pavia, which just got published uh, recently. And uh, other also, there is a minimal inflammation that you will see in the myocardium, and there is no myocarditis, whether it is autopsy or endomyocardial biopsy. But why is the myocardial injury occurring? If it is not coronary artery disease and if it is a non coronary uh, myocardial injury, it is possibly because of increase in cytokines, which is what you have seen that they have got much higher levels of these cytokines when there is the increase in the troponin as also there is a much higher level of the D dimers and all other things which is possibly causing the microvascular uh, thrombosis in these cases and they may have been resulting in the in the myocardial damage so the damage is possibly because of the thrombotic milieu or hemostatic milieu or it is possibly because of the cytokine storm and once you go to that side once you have gone over to the boundary on the other side your mortality becomes 90 percent as dr sharma showed in the right lower corner absolutely and there are other manifestations which is also coming up is the pulmonary thromboembolism pulmonary embolism and the dvt actually many reports having up to 20 30 percent of the dvt and vegetation and also as mentioned earlier that in situ thrombosis of the heart kidney spleen and brain now some symptoms of uh, uh, seizures agitation also occur in these uh, hospitalized patients. The fever, cough, these we have spoken about, Ch chest x-ray, chest CT, serologic test of the PCR with diagnostic, and of course, average length of stay is about 12%, and uh, we talked about uh, that days. some centers, uh, uh, I mean 12 days, and some, cent some of them have mortality from 1 to 12%, uh, uh, and so clearly patients with comorbidities have a higher mortality uh, with the, which we have mentioned. So now question is another point uh, that uh, this is the re report from Italy, age related phenomena. It clearly shows that patients who have pulmonary issues or age, they have a higher problem. And of course, once they deteriorate, they continue to increase the oxygen saturation, higher PEEP. Uh, and so, and then this is another study from uh, the causes of death. Uh, this various factors, uh, patients on admission who survived versus died. And it turns out to be all related to, uh, as uh, mentioned uh, by Dr. Narula, that uh, the cytokines is, besides the predisposing this factor, the cytokine measurement uh, really helps to prognosticate these patients and really create a, a subsequent uh, the prognosis. And of course, patients, uh, you, you know, once they are positive, people ask, once you are positive and the symptoms start, how they long they last, usually uh, 12 days and the virus become positive in many of these cases. And these are the increasing, particularly patient in the red bar, those who die, all these parameters uh, and markers continue to increase compared to people who do not die. So it seems to be those who are dying, having this severe inflammatory cytokine reaction and correlating. One of them which really come up is the myocardial injury, which is measured by troponin elevation, um, usually more than two times. And this actually has shown that myocardial injury versus no myocardial injury, higher ARDS, higher mortality in multiple papers. Uh, another paper from China, again, the patients who have a myocardial injury with or without associated more risk factors uh, with a myocardial injury, but more important that if you have myocardial injury, again, the mortality, survival, was about 50%, same which we showed uh, in earlier trial. 
The other is another study they, that myocardial uh, the troponin is correlate with other parameters like CRP uh, and pro BNP higher the troponin and patients who have established CAD and develop troponin elevation or myocardial injury mortality is 75 80 percent. So that's a big big uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, lesson we learned from uh, analysis. So if I put this one, myocardial injury during COVID-19 implications, very clear, patients with myocardial injury are older, obese, diabetes, hypertension, CAD. Patients with myocardial injury have higher systemic inflammation or the CRP, ferritin, procalcitonin, IL-6, higher leukocyte count, higher CPK, higher myoglobin and anti-proBNP. And then higher acute, these patients have higher acute respiratory distress and need for mechanical ventilation so that we can put it together. Hence, older patients with pre-existing cardiovascular morbidities, diabetes and obesity are prone to develop high acuity illness after contracting COVID-19, which is associated with higher incidence of myocardial injury and short-term death. So clearly, myocardial injury is a big, big problem in these patients and particularly these patients with a risk factor. And this is a very nice illustration of various points which we have spoken in terms of uh, myocardial infarction risk, uh, the myocardial uh, failure risk and myocardial, uh, the arrhythmia risk and all these factors individually. Though I think the, as mentioned uh, by Jagat, the plaque rupture, myocarditis, they are lower. It's a more of the myocardial injury and some cases with the uh, truly in situ thrombosis are responsible for problem. There is also data that higher coagulopathy and antiphospholipid antibody causing various end organ damage. And that's why there's a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, particularly the giving a thrombolytic therapy of these cases. So question now come back to quickly that uh, at a large various issues which we have spoken about uh, that what to do and uh, this slide basically summarized that most important is your aggressive hygiene skills and uh, we minimize exposure. And I think Anu is getting things ready to really implicate before we go to the medical treatment that how we should be doing as a public health major and we as a uh, the the healthcare worker to prevent our exposure. You want to show it now? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I just wanted to show you. Are you discussing PPEs? Right. No, just, just, you this know, is the protection. I, mean, I think. Part um, of it, yeah. Yeah. You will be talking later. What is the management of a patients yeah. who are presenting with ACS, especially STEMI or uh, um, you know people are presenting with chest pain, shortness of breath. So very difficult. I always say you got to take the history. I think what things have changed uh, uh, in the COVID era is a lot of telemedicine. Uh, in the initial part, when it uh, just started, uh, you know, I, I had sent fellows down to the ER for evaluation and they, they did get uh, infected, which I f f feel really bad. And since then, we are doing telemedicine, even with the ER consultation, looking at the EKG, uh, listen to the history, and then making a diagnosis if this patient needs to come to the lab immediately. Now, if they are to come to the lab immediately, everybody, the hospital has provided a full uh, PPEs. And I think I just want to show if they can say what the yes. PPEs that we normally yes. use. Yes. So this is the N95 mask. This was the initial version. This is the newer version, which looks like a duck. We call it a yeah, duck it mask. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, if yeah. people are, do not want to use anything for the eyes, yeah. which okay. I always say yeah. you should, this yeah. is the ideal one which you have to put around your, you have to put a, a cap, one or two caps, then you put this one. So you have a mask, cover your eyes with either of these two. These are the various masks they have provided. This is the cap. And you have to cover your shoe with this uh, shoe cover. This is first gown that we use, and this is the second gown that we use, and we always double glove. First glove, second glove. And if we can show there is a cart that a hospital provides, this is present in, in front of every room that all the staff and we physicians have to know how to use it. This is all the cleaning stuff that has been provided with all the PPEs that has kept inside and everybody has got a N95 mask testing as well as, uh, um, you know, so everybody knows what is the size of their mask and everybody has to use an N95 mask and a regular mask on top of that. And I can tell you that uh, with all these precautions and that we have been doing these cases, uh, COVID patients, uh, touched no physicians in uh, you know, our interventional department or the staff have uh, got this uh, disease. So emphasizing the, the personal protection 
and taking care of the areas so that the basic hygiene skills has to come back and to me one of the simplest one is washing your hands and this is uh, you know really uh, the usual i would say the indian ritual that before eating before meeting before anything you used to wash hand everything is coming back uh, to here and uh, and i think the most important is no touch technique yeah stay far from each other you know or uh, fold your hands uh, say namaste uh, and i think uh, you know unfortunately it will be all on the phone and the text messages how you uh, connect with each other and i think other thing impo important point for this uh, uh, personal protection also is the same that you come here and keep changing uh, for uh, every case yeah and uh, clearly the public health interventions have shown epidemiological changes and we know that where the outbreak started wuhan is back to business now that uh, compared to our we are in the lockdown so now another point is the anxiety among the healthcare professional that has been a paper written in jama about that what you do hear me protect me prepare me support me care for me so clearly very humanistic aspect of the healthcare worker which we need to take into account and most important another one is the yoga so basically uh, transcendental uh, yoga and relaxation uh, medicine techniques to uh, basically uh, to relax their mind so then the potential mechanism for targeted therapy most important treatment as we have spoken is prevention there is no treatment prevention the second to date there has been no consistent proven treatment for covid-19 and the last one covid-19 vaccine could be the final answer but will not be available for 4 to 12 months or even then it is questionable we have a lot of people talking about some minor mutations and so and so forth so therefore uh, the till we have a specific therapy we are need to treat patient for their cardiac problem as such and uh, appropriately so very nice paper in jama on about uh, pharmacological treatment of coronavirus disease and you want to talk about how the virus gets into the cell and various therapies which are working very nice illustration i really liked it and i'll uh, ask uh, after no jagat to comment on where which drug i know you mentioned briefly that which will have the best uh, chance to fight it anno first you yeah so you see that uh, the virus uh, is uh, sitting on uh, through the spike it's sitting on the receptor and then then gets into the host uh, cell and once it is uh, in the cell it requires some protease enzyme to cleave the envelope and that's what they call as unco coating and then the rna strand this is a long rna strand uh, you know comes into the cytoplasm actually you need to show the ribosomes also there you know the side it gets into that uh, there is replication i think the, uh, that is where you, we are talking that all this antivirals could work at various levels uh, of this and once new rna is formed which is on the right hand side then again there is a new structural protein that will come new virus is formed and uh, you know comes out which is called as exocytosis and that's how the replication happens and the virus is ready to be transmitted good now knowing that uh, jagat every day or every other day we hear a good news this this medicine working good second day we say oh you know the another trial should fail so based on all of this you tell me your prediction what will be we talking about after a month making it into a regular clinical practice so uh, uh, oh. dr sharma it is uh, anybody's guess to be very honest uh, with you but as you can see here that there are so many of them which we have shown and all the pathways have been very beautifully depicted in this diagram the two places which i am most hopeful are number one when we are saying that there is an increase in the cytokine now these are the different phases so once the viral infection is occurring i think we first have to stop that and my biggest hope here is going to the rna dependent rna polymerase inhibitors which is either the uh, remdesivir or the flaviviravir so remdesivir some of the uh, reports have already started to come as you know but uh, flaviviravir it looks like that is uh, uh, doing good in terms of japanese having showed that it is effective and chinese having confirmed that it is effective and now these studies are on and the most important study which is undergoing in united states is being done at uh, harvard in boston and uh, we should have the results uh, coming out soon so my biggest hope for the viral uh, proliferation 
would be to look at the RNA polymerase inhibition. inhibitors. Okay. That is one. And number two, once the cytokine storm has started and cytokines have started to take over, that will be the phase two. And that phase essentially is predominantly the IL-6 or the procalcitonin. These are the two most important one. And if you go after the IL-6, because those drugs are already available and they have been tried in the humans for the other indications, so that would be my hope that the tocilizumab or uh, the sarilumab, one of the two uh, uh, agents would probably be effective. I, uh, although there are multiple data about the lopinavir and uh, uh, others and uh, then uh, the yeah. hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and all, I think I have less of a faith there because there is no randomized data, number one. Number two, they don't seem to be specific enough to be able to control this effective virus. Beautiful. Good. So let's quickly finish this part. So knowing there's more of a theory and more for virologists, various treatment uh, of the, uh, with the chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, uh, lopinvir and the ritonavir, uh, and of course, uh, the uh, unfanovir, all these funny names, uh, remdesivir, favipir, although, uh, which uh, I'll just talk about some of the slides and some of the data, which I just put it here together, that overall still, those who have been in the trial, uh, the death rate is about 10% and so. So now coming back to the point uh, is uh, the one is the combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, non-label trial, we still have to wait for the randomized trial. I think we don't need to put much time, but we have to wait for the better data. Then the combination of lopinavir and ritonavir was shown no benefit, although the decrease of the ICU clinical uh, improvement by one day, but overall no difference in 20-day mortality. And then uh, the question about uh, remdesivir, it looks very good in one study, but the second study was no good. So it's still ongoing. Uh, United States, uh, big, uh, the, will have a data on the randomized way. They have uh, quite a bit uh, plan along with the placebo. Uh, and uh, the other question comes with the renin angiotensin system blocker. People, some people believed yes, some people believed no. But overall, maybe Anu can talk a little bit on this issue because knowing that if you're blocking the angiotensin receptor on AR2 is the host uh, for our, our like catchment uh, receptor for the virus. So could be beneficial or could not be beneficial? You want to highlight Anu on this? First, let me tell you why uh, there was initially that uh, discussion that the people, patients who are on ACE2 inhibitors uh, probably likely to have uh, um, you know, more disease is because if you see this pathway, you see angiotensin uh, renin uh, converts uh, to angiotensin 1. So uh, ACE inhibitor works at angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So when that ACE inhibitor is working, then you see that inhibition of that happens, angiotensin 1 is goes higher which gets converted to angiotensin 1 or 2 so there's an inhibition of that then what happens angiotensin 1 goes to angiotensin 1 to 9 ACE inhibitor is up regulated ACE 2 you know that is up regulated so when it is up regulated the, we already said this virus loves this receptor and probably that is why the patients were getting the disease that's one theory that was only shown in the animal study uh, other theory is also that, um, you know, this angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2 or are uh, pro-inflammatory and that could be another reason. The reason what we really are not seeing it uh, that these patients are probably not getting the disease who actually are on ACE inhibitors now, the different theory is that if uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, you know, angiotensin 1 to 9, angiotensin uh, 1 to 7, they are all uh, anti-inflammatory and that may be the reason actually patients who are on ACE inhibitor are probably, uh, you know, uh, benefited rather than uh, they have any side effects of that. So, uh, Jagat, you want to comment on this? I know yeah, you have written uh, on this. Yeah, yeah so uh, but Dr. Kinney uh, explained it extremely well. Uh, but the fact remains that uh, once you have the ACE, uh, presence of the ACE, and ACE and ACE2, as you know, are the homologs. They are, yeah. they are quite similar. Yep. And uh, they are both surface, on the surface, like on endothelium and other, they are, uh, they are both there. And they are the counterbalancing hormones. So ACE, ACE is more of uh, like causes the vasoconstriction, while the ACE2 will cause dilatation. One will cause uh, the sodium and water retention. The other one will cause the natriuresis and diuresis. One will be oxidative stress. The other one will be uh, the oxidative stress reliever with the nitric oxide increase and all 
uh, in the in the endothelium and all. So ACE2 basically is the protective molecule here. So what happens is that when the angiotensin 1 in the presence of ACE inhibitor is not converted to the angiotensin 2, more of it gets shunted to the angiotensin 1,9 and eventually to the angiotensin 1,7. Now 1,7 again requires the ACE and ACE inhibitors if are being given, it will also not convert. But then there is a direct conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 1, 7 by the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, endopeptidases or the, uh, the uh, natriuretic endopeptidases, NEP. And more of 1, 7, it goes to the uh, A2, A2 receptors uh, support uh, or the uh, upregulation, uh, not upregulation of its uh, over dominant activity and the Massey 1 receptors, uh, which are all protective receptors. So if the patient is on ACE inhibitors, or is on angiotensin receptor blocker, likelihood is that the angiotensin 1-7 would be more effective through the MATS receptors and would have a protective effect, which you can very easily find in a wonderful uh, review in JAK, which just appeared three days ago by Dr. Jeffrey Bender, and I was uh, uh, luckily the co-author of that paper. Very interesting. So this point, so basically uh, there are various studies going on in this aspect, but more important, all the uh, societies have said, don't take this medicine away, right? Uh, key is that if you are on ACE inhibitor, do not change it. And one of the, in this group, Comistat Mesalate uh, from Japan apparently is undergoing some trials. So now, very quickly, convalescent plasma for treatment of COVID-19, very early stages, a uh, few centers doing it, including Mount Sinai. We still need to wait for the results, but seems to be very good that patients who are recovered from uh, COVID, take their plasma, can go up to four patients, an FDA approved trial ongoing, but it is done within seven days of exposure. After that, patients start making their own antibody. It, doesn't, it is not effective. So the, they have a very clear-cut protocol and hopefully we'll know in this promising aspect. Then what about the BCG vaccine? People have spoken. The countries where they, the BCG is routinely used, the odd ratio of developing the COVID the symptoms and morbidity mortality is like five times lower. And we just consider with some innate uh, or trained immunity with innate response, we need to see a little more of the scientific data on this aspect. And then issues remains the coagulopathy, more important, we actually have done Mount Sinai, very nice anti-coagulation algorithm, particularly patients who are high risk with increased oxygen requirement, increased D-dimer, creatinine, CRP, the values are written below, that if those patients don't have high risk feature, then you just give low dose apixaban or half dose anoxaparin. But if they are admitted to ICU, in those cases, based on the creatinine clearance, you decide whether to use anoxaparin or apixaban uh, and clearly continue heparin, and particularly if you think about uh, PE. And more important, on the right side, patients who are discharged on anticoagulation for at least two weeks, uh, prophylactic anticoagulation, apixaban, five milligram twice a day for two weeks is preferred. So very nicely. So just let me sum this part up of our, and I had to read it, although it is a little uh, longer, but I took me a little time, that our understanding of the COVID-19, its diagnosis, prevention, and treatment is rapidly evolving. What we learned one week ago is wrong this week. Physicians are asked to check the website of the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention, professional societies for the latest guidance, including institutional protocols. As the disease spreads and new evidence emerges, it would be prudent to identify the risk factor for the development of cardiac complications in patients with COVID-19. A prospective registry of patients, as we have spoken, with COVID-19 with a systemic, systematic recording of clinical variables in United States, not China, not Italy, not Spain, here. And the cardiovascular complication will be beneficial to identify the pattern of cardiovascular complication, to develop a risk model for cardiac complication, and to identify and or predict response to various treatment modalities. Most important factor to limit the disease process will be adoption of widespread testing for both COVID-19 antigen and antibody, besides other precautionary measures which we have spoken. So very quickly, the second point, I want to take a few minutes only, the incidence management of the STEMI. The question is, is this business as usual or rational for thrombolytic or fibrolytic therapy? And these are the five points I have written that primary PCI strategy is time intense and extensive resource utilization of the many of the cat lab has been deployed. You don't have the staff. Potential extensive exposure to healthcare workers for infection, potential delays, late presentation like our case, slow steps in the ER visit care, 
delayed testing, staff PPE use before taking care of the patient, they have to take care of themselves. As uh, pointed out by Anno, that you need to be fully protected. Then immediate reperfusion injury, perfusion using thrombolytic therapy can mitigate many of these system-based delays and can avoid wait for COVID testing. So very simple. And of course, TNK versus uh, TPA need to be seen. TNK is a single dose. TPA takes 45 to 60 minutes. And this actually has come back to the fibrinolytic or thrombolytic therapy, which we almost gave up. 30 years ago, but still used in some cases in the uh, in the world. Even in United States, about 11% patients with a STEMI getting thrombolytic therapy, usually small areas uh, where they cannot get to the at a PCI within 90 minutes or 120 minutes. So getting a thrombolytic therapy, but clearly this whole issue of the thrombolytic has coming back up. Now, at the same time, what we have seen is the STEMI. The overall incidence of STEMI has decreased in this current era. You can see activation of the STEMI has decreased compared to what used to be on average about 24 in the first two months. Now that has become 15. So clearly 38% reduction in the STEMI activation in this pandemic. Now, therefore, you say, well, if those who need it, you can give the thrombolytic therapy. And what has been shown, the pharmacoinvasive approach, that you do a thrombolytic, but then patient gets the cath within 24 hours or get after 60 to 90 minutes if they fail. Only biggest drawback is the intracranial hemorrhage. And I think if you avoid, uh, do a low dose, uh, clopidogrel 300 milligram only, and patients who are elderly, you don't give thrombolytic, may be okay. You'll have a lower intracranial hemorrhage. So there are various STEMI algorithms have been pop pop uh, populated. This is the one from circulation by and the masjid and so, uh, and we actually have modified our algorithm using this uh, strategy, whether COVID positive or COVID negative, particularly if uh, waiting on the left side, if the known exposure, you have to then think about giving thrombolytic therapy. And of course, PCI only for when there is a failed rescue PCI or contraindication. And otherwise you do the business as usual if we know the COVID is negative. And of course, absolute contraindication of thrombolytic, we very well know. But more important, what we learn is, if you're COVID positive and you have a lot of comorbidities, overall outcome is bad. The classical case, which we showed New York State, uh, New York City, uh, the 90% mortality, many of them, those are myocardial injury, STEMI elevation with myocardial injury, 90% mortality, mortality. Probably they don't need to come to the cath lab. Just treat them medically. With those uh, comorbidities, we have answered there. And if there's no co comorbidities, then of course you go to a thrombolytic therapy and uh, patient who are hemodynamic instable, then you use the cardiac cath and angio and of course the LV support. And uh, they, But if thrombolytic fail, you always have to bring the, a patient is otherwise viable, does not have comorbid, comes back to the cath lab and you decide what to do. This is your algorithm. Actually, it's a really uh, very nice, simple one, uh, Samir particularly using your rapid COVID test, which has some question how accurate it is. But yes, if you have a rapid data, it will be very useful uh, to take care of this. Now, other just came out this morning about uh, from ACC. I had to just learn a little more, but I included this. What is the recommendation uh, from uh, ST elevation on the electrocardiogram based on the symptoms and combined decision? So more important, one point I just want to complete our presentation with the STEMI issue is what we have seen significant reduction in STEM uh, during COVID-19 surge. The question is why? 30 to 70 percent reduction shown everywhere. Uh, it's a paradox as STEMI incidence increases during influenza season and respiratory illnesses. So question is why? Is it COVID-19 implantation, the implemented strategies uh, like overall improved mental and physical health, balanced diet and home cooked meal, more reduction in pollution and nitrogen oxide, vehicular traffic, less airlines, or marked reduction in hospital or ER visit, and potential increase in cardiac events at home. So this is the fourth factor, maybe contributory, and this actually has put nicely uh, with the Jagat on the green of various triggers of this myocardial infarction, the reduced physical, mental stress, healthy eating, reduced air pollution, smoking, all working through to decreasing the overall incidence of cardiac events. So it's not just the late presentation, in my opinion. It is also the reduced uh, trigger for various of these cardiovascular events. So just to sum up, we still have to think about while COVID-19 killing quite a bit of patients, but still 
cardiology of the heart disease remains the number one killer more than COVID-19. Maybe in the short term could be different, but clearly the heart disease remains on the top. And therefore, uh, ACC actually has put a very nice uh, uh, the pictorial uh, to send to our patients, to everyone that don't ignore your heart symptoms. Sitting at home, like our patient, young person got such a massive damage to the heart because he delayed coming to the hospital 40 hours. So very important that uh, get to the medical help once your symptoms changes. And the lastly, this is a little, uh, you know, a tricky that whether this virus came out uh, was truly was made in the bench or in the lab versus came from the uh, animal. I just want to put this as a, a very, uh, you know, provocative thought. So Nobel Prize winner, the who uh, invented or who, uh, you know, basically the knew about the HIV virus saying that this was not a, uh, it was a man-made virus and not natural. Lastly, the virus vaccine may be ready for mass production as we have spoken and that probably will be the best one. The, what has happened? That our life has changed and I'll just sum this up. The digital re revolution, while everybody has gone down, the digital companies have really made their living and actually maybe that's the right thing to do. That going forward, lot of things will be done on the digital way. So just to sum this up, that we are amidst of the unbelievable historic pandemic from COVID-19 with the leading to high morbidity and mortality up to 10% in large number of cases, especially with risk factors of old age, CVD, diabetes, and obesity. Myocardial injury is common in high risk patients and associated with ventilator requirement and high short-term mortality. There is no proven treatment for COVID-19 so far. Hence, appropriate diagnosis and subsequent management of cardiovascular complication is essential to improve prognosis of these patients. And then overall incidence of STEMI has significantly reduced in COVID-19 era and maybe the result of COVID implementation strategies. Stay home, eat good food, do exercise and relax mentally. Patients presenting with STEMI and possible COVID exposure, PUI or COVID positive may be better served with thrombolytic therapy rather than primary PCI to avoid staph exposure. COVID STEMI should continue to get PPI. COVID STEMI negative should get uh, regular PPI. So three questions following are the conditions predisposing to COVID-19 except age 65, diabetes, obesity, age less than 45 and COPD. Clearly the answer is D. The second question, following statements are true regarding cardiovascular manifestation of COVID-19 except myocardial injury, arrhythmia, STEMI is always with normal coronaries, in-situ coronary thrombosis, and pulmonary thromboembolism. Clearly, that uh, many of those patients will still have obstructive disease, not the normal coronaries. The last third question, following our suggested factor responsible for lower STEMI in COVID-19 era, except concerned about coming to hospital for COVID exposure, excessive eating and drinking, better physical and mental health, lower pollution, higher medication compliance, Clearly, the answer will be the excessive eating and drinking is not happening because you're not getting your re restaurant food. And I'm sure soon the alcohol will be limited also. Yeah, Anu actually has something to show. Yeah, we are done here. Okay, next question. So I, with that, I pr complete my presentation, yes. Anu, you were going to share something else with us? Uh, no, uh, I think uh, he mentioned Right. The, about uh, exercise and uh, yoga, um, just, you know, one of the things that I think we are promoting during this time, uh, I agree the, the most important reason, you know, why everything is done, people are home, uh, this social distancing, but that's not how life is going to be. There's an also a lot of damage that's happening to the younger generation with social distancing, closing schools, uh, the usual life is uh, not there. Um, I, I just wanted to focus on uh, exercise as well as uh, yoga. I think something that may help because since this uh, virus goes through the respiratory system, um, we, something that I promoted on my wellness uh, website is benefits of, uh, I don't know if they can show, benefits they should, yeah. of, uh, you know, pranayama, which is, uh, can we see that better? Pranayama, yes, yes, which yes. is... Uh, we, we, we see it a little more uh, focused. That's much better, uh, Philip. Uh, yeah, good. There we go. Yeah, so essentially you see that in this uh, breathing, yeah, yeah Kalpabhati breathing, uh, Kapal which is also called yeah, as Kapal a pranayama Bhati. breathing, what uh, helps uh, is that, um, you know, deep breath definitely 
improves your alveolar opening. You know, normally what happens is many of us are do shallow breathing, right? When you take a deep breath, which means your diaphragm has to move down, your belly also expands. So there is, um, you know, your diaphragm gets stronger, your chest gets stronger, as well as your abdomen gets stronger. And more important is that your alveoli, which are at the base that normally don't function, will start functioning when you start practicing this uh, deep breath. And uh, the also theory that when you do this breathing, there's a lot of uh, what is called as cleansing that happens, may be important during this uh, COVID time that uh, you can do this breathing. This is uh, on my Instagram page, as well as on my uh, wellness uh, website, saying that there are uh, three components, but uh, essentially nice deep breathing through the nose and then a full exhalation, forceful exhalation, but more important is deep breath. And you'll know this, if you have to practice this properly, it's not that easy. You may think, oh, it's simple breathing, but try to do exactly the way it's been explained. It's not that easy, but try to do it at least, uh, you know, eight to 10 times, three, four times a day. Okay. Anu, Good. Very useful. Yeah. Uh, Samin, a very important uh, question comes uh, after you're uh, showing the slide from stream. Obviously, in the present environment, we cannot be taking these people uh, for a uh, for a cardiac cath and evaluating their angiography after lytic therapy, no? Yeah, so that's the second point. So class one recommendation, as you know, uh, you have been involved, is that you give thrombolytic and do the cath within six to 24 hours. But I would say you do cath only now on a rescue basis, not routine. Got it. Yeah, and let it be done later on now. Also, there is a trick to it. Point is, if you do a STEMI, you can send that patient to the floor don't need to be an ICU. Right, Maybe right. you give thrombolytic, that will require ICU. Second point, the thrombolytic people have a longer length of stay compared to the PCI. So I think it's a crossroad. But most important issue here is the exposure to the staff, whether it's a, your worker, your, your, your porter, your cardiovascular technician, nurses, your fellows, attending. So this is where at the prime importance and availability. Because we know that many of the cath lab staff have been deployed. If the, my cath lab staff is doing um, uh, taking care of the COVID units uh, relentlessly for 12 hours, uh, four times a week. And uh, so they're not available. So many places, that's an issue. So all these things taken together, I would say that in unless patient is hemodynamically unstable uh, and is a COVID negative, let it be a thrombolytic at the first level. So let Absolutely. me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, let me ask a question from Dr. Sharma. Uh, the only one imaging modality which has seen a maximum use in this time, I mean, uh, yeah. probably two, yeah. uh, echocardiography on the bedside, uh, more of a point of, uh, uh, like a POCUS yep. type of a point of care ultrasound, but also CT, NGR, yes. uh, CT imaging yeah. because yeah. Uh, of the lungs. Yes. What about the CT and geography in these cases when you are in doubt rather than bringing them to the cath lab? Very good point. So we actually had dealt with those two patients in last three weeks who were presented with the looks like COVID and uh, had the lung involvement and uh, required a little bit, uh, you know, different gating. And so, so one patient, they said diffuse CAD, but not obstruction, but it's multiple. Other one was not. And those both, both patients were managed medically. But yes, CT angio in a questionable case is very important. It gives you the right answer whether, because we know, we saw it. ST elevation actually more happens with the myocardial injury than the Truly mm -hmm. obstruction, which we have seen in the 90, 18 patient report from the New York City. So it's the CT angio uh, with a quick diagnosis or triaging these patients will be very helpful. They are not ready to do CT angio with also, uh, not knowing uh, the PUI status. That may be also so that issue. also delays. So if there is a delay and you want to decide on one test, uh, probably cath lab is a better uh, a place yeah. to get a, a definite diagnosis. Um, and as you see, we are all fully equipped. Um, I think one point I need to add there, uh, when you see these patients in the ER, if there's a definite uh, exposure of COVID and there are comorbidities that we already described and that patient is coming 
to the ER with the so-called, uh, you know, definite story of uh, STEMI and EKG shows ST elevation. These patients have a mortality about 60% or higher. Or 90% in our New York state data. Yeah. I mean, New York City data. Yeah. So those patients are nothing 90%. wrong in saying, I think it's a medical therapy is not a, is a best option, uh, both uh, in the presence of STEMI as well as uh, COVID, uh, you know, on presentation. Anu, the okay. demonstration of the PPE, I'm sure, will be extremely beneficial uh, to our viewers. Uh, we have also implemented something extremely simple, that any patient coming to the cath lab, we also put the mask on the patient. I think yeah. that's a very simple and yeah. a useful step. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jagat, thank you for sharing so much of your profound intellect. Uh, it has been a pleasure having you here. There is one last uh, very controversial thing uh, which I'm going to ask you. I don't think it has any answers, but with the 5,000 experience in New York, you think we have been overventilating patients? I don't think I can really answer okay. that question. I understand that I completely. can uh, and, uh, try to answer that question. I don't think we are over ventilating the patients. Um, though I can tell you based on uh, the governor uh, who has tried to get a lot of ventilators, if you see um, Elon Musk has uh, uh, gave ventilators to Sinai, we have uh, uh, present a lot of ventilators, they're trying to do, you know, uh, uh, double ventilation, which is not that easy. Uh, both patients should have same, uh, uh, you know, vital capacity mm -hmm. and all right. these things. When the, the, there is guidelines written by, by these ICU people, like they have presented the anticoagulation guidelines, only if they need it, they will do it because what they have seen, once they have gone on the ventilator, they are on the ventilator three to four weeks or longer. And then subsequently they get, uh, you know, uh, later on uh, develop complications because they're on the ventilator for a longer period of time. So they are doing it only if it is uh, when uh, it's necessary and based on their protocol. So uh, I would I would add to that uh, a bit uh, in the sense that the reason I said that I do not, I can't give the answer to that is that when to bring them on to the ventilator is a very important question. And obviously there are guidelines from the intensive, inten intensivists and all. But uh, the important thing is that if we have gone too far, probably we have made a mistake. So in that term, starting it early probably does not mean that it is overventilating. Yeah. So in the yeah. right terms, I cannot answer the question what yeah. he asked. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, on, in the on, philosophical way, mm -hmm. I think I would be yeah. going more with what on, on a practical illustration, I can tell you that I thought the best managed patient uh, globally has been the Prime Minister Boris Johnson. And whoever made the wise decision not to intubate him that day, I think uh, did a remarkable job. I thank you all for an uh, uh, amazing session. I have no doubt that uh, viewers will find this uh, extremely important. Uh, people related to the cath lab area who are frightened, uh, interventional cardiologists, just trying to find the best algorithms uh, how to treat these patients. Uh, Jagat, uh, uh, tell me any final thoughts you have. Yeah. So uh, when you were talking about the boys Johnson, uh, there is no fun uh, that I'm trying to make here. Probably he made the decision himself. Maybe, maybe, uh, <laughs> yeah. but but I think uh, whoever you know in the on a Sunday night when he's moved to the intensive care unit. <laughs> I think uh, intubation at that time may have changed the course of British history. Anu? Uh, I just, uh, you know, showed all the PPEs and I think for the, all the cath lab staff out there and everything you, it has to be very, uh, everybody should know that the reports that have come out, all the publications that have come out from China, uh, that healthcare workers were infected, physicians at younger age were infected, all these people in the early part did not know anything about this virus and they were taking care of the patients without any protection. And like I mentioned, so we are doing these cases with the protection uh, exactly the way I've described. And if we do that, we can take care of the sick patients and protect ourselves. So these PPEs are very important and they have been provided and everybody has been well trained. So once you use PPE, you can take care of this patient. I do not want uh, people out there to be frightened that uh, you should not take care of this patient. We are here to help them during this uh, important crisis. Okay. Samin, uh, I'll conclude by quoting from a recent editorial I wrote uh, about the role of physicians in COVID-19. Uh, 
I do not think, and I am I am confident. I speak for most physicians. Uh, I do not think that uh, we are asking at this moment for any recognition. This is precisely the reason we became doctors. The only thing we require is uh, better protection for ourselves and our colleagues in the hospital, and for patients to take all the precautions so that they do not end up in the hospital. I hope uh, this session has been extremely useful. We will see you during the next session on May the 19th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.